I would love to invite you, please, to open up your New Testaments to the first Thessalonian letter. Most of our content today, our reading and discussion, will be from this beautiful letter that we read in our kind of daily Bible reading that we do around here just about a week or two ago. And I've really been looking forward to sharing some things with you. To set up for that read in 1 Thessalonians, let's talk a little bit about a character in the Bible named the Apostle Paul. His conversion story was an incredible, miraculous one on the road to Damascus, and he began going on missionary journeys, teaching the gospel to others, and a part of that was the writing of letters. We believe that the Apostle Paul wrote 13 or so of your New Testament letters. Nearly half of what you have is because of this guy sitting down, sometimes having others write it for him, but writing out these very personal letters. This is an actual photo of Paul writing this letter, which is super tough to come by. We don't have those kinds of photographs, but other than the times that others wrote it on his behalf and he sat there and dictated it, this was the idea. And we call them letters on purpose because that's what they were. They were personal connections he had with churches or individuals. It wasn't strangers. And he was writing things that he addressed directly to them that you and I are able to draw all kinds of great benefits from. Now, particularly today, I want to talk about the letters that he wrote to churches because I'm thinking about the Lindell Church. I'm thinking about this fellowship, those who are members of this fellowship, those who are visiting here, considering working with this local church. What we like to do is look at these letters that he wrote to these churches and think, okay, what was he trying to tell them and how does that relate to us? Well, admittedly, in some cases it's harder than others because in some ways we're a lot like New Testament churches and in some ways we're a lot different. Here's an example of that. About a month ago, we did a lesson on the church in Corinth, 1 Corinthians. That church had a lot of problems. They were heavily segregated and divided, and it was showing up in a half a dozen different ways. And Paul has to sit down and write a letter and say, look, we're all Christians here. We all live under the grace of God, but we need to work our way through this. Well, that's a beneficial letter, but it does not, to me, describe the Lindell Church very much at all. Really not even that much in our history, though little things pop up here and there. Another example is the letter that John later wrote to the seven churches of Asia, and he wrote a church to Ephesus. When he wrote that letter to Ephesus, they were about as old as the Lindell church was. And what was going on there? They were doctrinally really, really sound and strong, but they had lost what? Their first love. Like there was this hollow place in their heart. They had hardened doctrinally to the expense of mercy. Well, that's beneficial for us, but that's, that's not this church. I don't know of a person in the room that would describe this church as a place that's missing that heart of the gospel. But there's still things we can work on. To me, the first Thessalonian letter is the one. It is the one, in my estimation, I've been here eight and a half years, that best describes the people that I'm seeing right here in the room that work together. And so we're going to take a look at that letter together today and a little bit more particularly tonight. This is maybe best known as the Excel Still More letter. And the idea is this, you're doing pretty well. There are some particular areas where you're doing quite well. And I think that could be said of this group, from our shepherds to our deacons, to our families, to the members here. The message of this letter is take the things you're doing well and don't let the world stop you from growing those things. I mean, that's the risk, isn't it? The risk is you take what you are in Christ and what you give to Christ and what you do in Christ and you just sort of stop right there and try to keep it from receding. There's nothing in the New Testament that says, hold what you got. Everything is about moving further, growing deeper, spreading wider. And for me, as a preacher here, that's my message for you today. There are some wonderful qualities in this room. We mustn't let the world tell us we've come far enough excel still more. Where do we get that idea? Well, Paul got it from a podcast. It was something he heard one time. Now, long before any of that stuff, he used this terminology. In chapter 4 in verse 1, and we'll dig into it more in just a moment, but in chapter 4 in verse 1, he says, finally then, brethren, we request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us instruction as to how you ought to walk and please God, and you're doing that, you actually do it, that you excel still more. For you know what commandments we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. It almost sounds like he's saying, I gave you some things to do and you're doing it. I'm going to give you more. I want you to see other things. I want you to grow in that. Excel still more in your walk and in your obedience. 
In the same chapter, in verse 9, he turns his attention to the love of the brethren. He said, you don't need me to write to you about that. For you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. And it's pretty clear that they do love one another. For indeed, he says, you do practice it towards all the brethren who are in all Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, to excel still more. Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, attend to your own business, work with your hands, just as we commanded you. In other words, let's turn the drama down so that we can turn the love up. And that's the end of the sermon. I'll quit right there. End of sermon. You want a short one? Let's turn the drama down. Let's turn down all of the stuff that's getting all mixed up and everything else and it's getting us so distracted so that we can just settle down and get to work and love each other more. So excel still more. If you don't like that phrase, I've told people in the podcast many times, if you don't like that phrase, go back to chapter 3, verse 12, when he says, increase and abound. Same idea. Okay, go to chapter 1. Sounds great. Awesome mission, 2024. Let's take what we've got. Let's increase it. But what particularly needs to be increased? What are the qualities that we can identify that we possess and we need to figure out what they are and figure out how to turn them into something more? Well, that list is given to us three things at the very beginning of the letter. So go back with me to chapter one, please, and I'll just read the first few verses. First Thessalonians chapter one. Paul and Silvanus and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for all of you, making mention of you in our prayers. Here it is. Bearing constantly in mind your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness, this version reads, steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the presence of our God and Father, knowing beloved brethren by God, his choice of you. And then he goes on to talk about how even in great affliction, verses five and six, even under great persecution, you understood that God had a work he wanted to fulfill in you and you pursued through it. And this is what it is. Very simple list. You've seen it a hundred times. This is what you've got. And this is what we want to turn up to 11. You have the work of faith. You have the labor of love. You have the steadfastness of hope. You had it even in the face of persecution. The world wants you to stop cultivating it. And you need to push through. Now, that's what's true of the group I'm looking at right now. I mean, everything I just said to me is exactly what we need to hear, and it was exactly what he was saying. We've got this. We need more. What's different is the world was pushing on them in a different way than the world is pushing on us. Do you understand that statement? In their time, the Bible says in verse 5 and 6, it was tribulation, verse 6. They were being attacked. They were being threatened. They were being arrested. They were having guys like Jason in this very town dragged out of his home. The world is going to try to force you to stop. You excel still more and don't cater to the world. Well, I don't think the world we're in right now uses tribulation. I think it uses inundation and assimilation. I think the world is trying to get you to stop growing all three of these things. It's just they're not going to show up at your door and threaten to arrest you. They're just going to show you some TV programming. They're just going to get you involved in a bunch of worldly stuff that doesn't matter or, or local community things that take the place of God. The world is like, stop growing in this. And if your thought is, well, I am really tied up in the world right now and I don't know that I'm getting better in any of this, but at least I got some of it. Then you miss the point of all of Christianity. The point isn't to have some of it. The point is to be directional and growing against the grain of the world. So here's a question. What are these three things? Let's say your family and my family went out to dinner afterwards and we said, what is work of faith and labor of love instead? It sounds awesome. sounds true and right. But if you had to sit down today and go, this is what that is in my life and this is what I'm going to do with it. I think we would struggle with that. I think terms like this just become terms that we use and they don't mean anything. I want you to get a better grip on what these are. You can't improve on something that you can't define. You can't help something that you can't identify. Now, to do that, I want to look at these phrases just a minute. If we're going to understand what these phrases are, there is a word that appears in each one of them that's actually kind of a big deal. I'm going to go all nerdy-wordy on you for a moment, but there's a word that's a big deal, and it's that one right there. 
If you're going to figure out what work of faith is, you need to know what the word of is. It's used in all three of these. I think a better understanding of what these phrases are doing in terms of construction is really going to help us. So what does the word of mean? I'm going to give you a second to decide what you think, because of has like four or five different definitions. What does the word of mean in this phrase? Well, here's a pretty popular concept. That the word of means for or unto. In other words, I work so that I can get to faith. I labor so that I can get to love. I am steadfast and as the result of that steadfastness, I will get to a place of hope. Here's an example of that. There aren't a whole lot of modern examples of that because that's not usually the way we use the word of. But here's one. Pursuit of excellence. Excellence is out there. You don't have it yet. You want it? You want excellence? Then you start by pursuing it. You pursue for excellence. I want to go on record early and emphatically that that's not what's going on here. That would be basically saying that you're that grace is the result of works. That would be saying that I get internally as a result of the external. That would be saying once I've done enough works, faith will start to exist. That would say once I've labored enough, God will love me. Or once I've been steadfast for long enough, I'll start to begin that maybe there is hope. That is not the gospel. And I'm doing this with my hands and using gruffy language because I think there's some in this room who maybe believe that. That what we're really talking about is bootstrap. You get better at all the first stuff, and then all the second stuff will start happening inside of you. That is not the gospel message. Let me give you an example. An example would be faith, since it's one of ours. Look in Hebrews chapter 11. What is faith in Hebrews chapter 11? Faith is belief in Jesus, in God, in his power, and his glory. It is trusting in his power and in his promises. The text says in Hebrews 11, 1, that faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Verse 3, faith is understanding that God made everything and that we are made because of God. Faith, verse 6, is believing that God is and that God is a rewarder of those who seek him. Faith is not sourced in the result of my works. Faith is sourced in God. Faith is sourced in his designer power, in his presence, in what he has done. And then verse 7, because I trust, because Noah trusted, he went and built an ark. Because Abraham trusted, verse 8, he obeyed the commands that he was given because he believed that God could raise people from the dead. So defining this is a pretty big deal. Because what I don't need you doing is leaving here going, I need to grow in all this. I don't have a lot of motivation to do so. I don't particularly have the faith to do so. But I'll just go work harder and it'll all fall into place. It won't. It won't fall into place because that's not what this means. Here's a better idea. This is much more common in the New Testament. It's also much more common in our normal language. And that is the word from. Work from faith. Labor from love. Steadfastness from hope. In other words, my work is inspired by my trust in the Lord. My labor is because of God's love for me and my love for him and my love for others. I am steadfast because there is a hope of heaven given to me by the Lord. Now, I could give you lots of examples of this. Here are three. I thought you'd like this first one. The little sign outside says, Church of Christ. That means we are a church that comes from Christ. Like he is the power, and we, even though we're first on the sign, we are last in the sequence. We are derived from him. Voice, I've just used a couple of regular everyday things, voice of experience. It's not a voice that gets you to experience. Experience is the central thing, and there's a voice that comes from it. Wise sayings. Rays of sunshine. You don't start with the rays and end up at the sun. The sun is the source of the rays and the rays come from it. That's the idea here. Let me give you a Bible example. This is action. There's definitely action. We're going to talk about action today. But that action is derived from something about God. From something that God provides for or builds or evidences. Here's a great example. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm using the word... Love in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I gave you an example of faith a minute ago in Hebrews 11. 
Faith is this trust in God. Actions grow out of that. They're, in, they're perfectly connected. They work together beautifully. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14, for the love of Christ controls us. That's it. The love of Christ controls us. Having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. He died for all, so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Now you might go, well, maybe the love of Christ is your love for Christ. That's not the context. The context is, verses 14 and 15, he loves you. He loved you enough to die for you, verse 15, to be raised again, verse 15, on your behalf. Because he loves me, I let him control me. Does that make sense? Because he loves me, he controls me. That's the order. So while this is written in this way, if you were going to describe it to someone, watch what I'm going to do here. It's not too complicated. I'm just going to kind of remove the figure language and put it this way. This is basically what this text is saying. Paul's writing to the Thessalonians. He's going, look, you have faith in the Lord. And that faith has put you to work. You love God and you feel his love for you. And as a result of that, you're working pretty hard. You have a lot of hope. You have assurances based purely on God. That's none of that is from us. And you've translated that hope into steadfastness. Now, I want you to excel in all six of these. I want you to excel in all of it. Now, here's what that means, getting down to some practicalities for the rest of our study today. It means that if you and I are going to excel, which of these sides do we need to excel in? Both of them. I can't just go out and go, all right, Chris, just seriously, this is the longest intro ever. Just tell me what to do. Would you just, you know, because I know my audience, you know I, know, I know the audience. I see who's looking at me. We're like, get to the rubber meeting the road, please. If you want us to do more, prove that we need to do more, and we'll go out and try to do more. You won't probably do it, but, it, you know, we'll, I'll preach about it again in a month, and we'll try it again. Like, give me more to do. Okay, yeah, yeah, there's more to do. But if you think, for two seconds, that you can increase your work without deepening your faith, then you're fooling yourself. And you're probably going to start putting your pride on the works you accomplish, but you're not going to have the faith to hold them and everything's going to collapse upon itself. If you think we can add labor, but you don't love people more first, forget about it. That labor will wear out as fast as the seasons if there's not a deepened, transforming love within you motivating that. And the same with hope and steadfastness. So if we're going to grow... We've got to grow on the inside, which is sourced in what God is and does, and then on the outside. But I know I didn't convince everyone, so I'll go ahead and start on this side. Would that make you happy? I will start over here. I'll start with, okay, Chris, just give me the, give me the stuff. Okay, here's, here's what it means to grow in these things. I'm going to use three phrases. They all have I-N-G in them because it reflects growth. It's not do this thing. It is keep growing in doing this thing. Really, just tell me what the work is. Here's the work. Turning from idols. 2024, I think I've got the faith. Tell me what I need to do. Turn from idols. Keep turning from idols. Identify the things that are getting in the way of you and God and turn from those things. Make the cuts. Make the sacrifices. Announce what they are and change those things. That's what the letter says. It's in the letter. I'm just going to use the letter. I didn't make up these three to fit some narrative. I'm just drawing them straight from the letter. Look in 1 Thessalonians again in chapter 1. He said, man, you got to start off so awesomely. Verse 8, you were incredibly evangelistic. Chapter 1, for the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith toward God has gone forth so that we have no need to say anything. Here's what they've been saying. For these people we visit, they, they themselves report about us what kind of a reception we had with you. How you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God, to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. That is Jesus who rescues us from all wrath to come. He said, that's how this thing started. It started with a major move in your life where you said, this is what I was living for. I'm turning away from it. It's an idol in my heart and I'm going to live for Jesus. He said, excel in that. Excel in those choices. I'll give you an example of what one of them is, because we kind of go, idols though? Like, what are we talking about when we talk about idols? I'll give you an idol. This won't apply to everyone. 
You know what an idol is? Immorality is an idol. Sexual immorality is an idol. Pornography is an idol. Uncontrolled lust is an idol. They are things that replace the will of God, they replace the joy of God, and they work exactly contrary to what God wants for your life. I'm still in the letter, chapter 4. Finally, chapter 4, he said, excel still more. I want you to excel still more, verse 1. I want you to hear these commandments and live by the authority of the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. That is that you abstain from sexual immorality. That each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. Not, like, not in lustful passion like the Gentiles. They don't even know God. You're supposed to know God. Faith. You're supposed to know God. Do you know him? You see how we're always going to end back there like... To the extent that you know him, it can transition the way you live. If you're living like this, because you don't know him. So I know I'm starting with the end instead of the beginning. But he says, look, you've got to turn and know God. God, verse 7, has not called us to be impure. Are you kidding? He's called us to be sanctified. He who rejects this is not rejecting man, but the God. Here's your idolatry. He who rejects this is not rejecting man or, or my parents or somebody else. You're rejecting God who gives his holy. That's idolatry. Rejecting God for something. You want to know what it is? You're like, get to the meat and taters. <clears throat> Turning from a I'm going to just get, here I go. I need to quit. I need to move on because I just. There's a lot of prayer and thought about what's happening in the church today and why there is so much drifting and why attendance across the nation is declining and why things. And it's like, what's the devil doing? Is he arresting us? Is he threatening our jobs? What's he doing? He is just showing you so many other things to do with your time, and they're so awesome, and they're so fun, and they get you notoriety, and they pay off. It's idolatry, everyone. That's all, all that is. Let's grow in turning from that and putting God first. Number two, prioritizing these go together. Prioritizing one another. You go, okay, labor of love. Okay, I need, to, I need to show my love, and that love needs to turn into labor. Well, the most dominant message of practically the whole New Testament lettership is to love your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. And that's sort of what replaces that idolatry, doesn't it? You spend less time enamored by the world, you spend more time with Christians. And learning about Christianity and helping each other through all these trials. And we commit ourselves to them. I noticed here in chapter 3, verse 6, he talked about their love for him, which is really, really great. You know, this is a letter. It's personal. So he says in, in verse 6, you know, your love, you think kindly of us. And I love that. He says, verse 11, chapter 3. 1 Thessalonians 3, 11. Now may our God and Father himself and Jesus our Lord direct our way to you. And may the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all people, just as we also do for you, so that he may establish your hearts without blame and holiness before our God and Father at the coming of the Lord Jesus with all of his saints. Increase. I wish this was a class and we could talk. What would it mean to increase in your love for brethren? I'm just going to pause here for, for a second. This is purely you having a conversation with yourself. If this year I turned from idols and I loved God's people more. I became more interested in the body of Christ than in my own life. What does that look like? I want you to think about that. Because these become these just phrases, you know, ooh, love God's people more. What does that mean? What does it mean for you? I'm tempted to give you a list, but that'd be Chris's list. What's yours? You want to grow? We grow in prioritizing one another. And we could spend the rest of the morning reading a plethora of passages that talk about that. Uh, I think I said this a couple weeks ago. Remember, you were not converted into a relationship with Jesus, not in the way you think. You were converted into his body to become a part of a family, to be a piece of a kingdom. And that means prioritizing my part in it and how I relate to it and how I love God's people. Number three steadfastness. What does he talk about at the end of the letter? He talks about living for eternity. I'm not just talking about a couple songs that we sing or some token things that we say or a t-shirt or two. I'm talking about growing in the fact that I am here to please God and get to heaven. I live for eternity. That's the idea. Look at the end of the text, chapter four. Remember, this one we know pretty well. Chapter four, verse 13. 
We do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, that is, those who have died already, so that you will not grieve like everybody else in the world is grieving. Because we believe that Jesus died and rose again. God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord, we will not precede those who have died, who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. We shall always be with the Lord. Comfort one another with these words. How do you, how do you find comfort in sorrow? Nearly everybody in this room has faced some sort of sorrow in the last calendar year. Sickness, sadness, loss, and death. How do you cope with that? I sure hope you're growing and living for eternity. Because it is the only way to cope with any of that. You've lost loved ones, you've lost people you cared about, but we're just trying to get to heaven anyway. The point is to live faithfully and get to heaven. So a Christian dies, praise God, that someone has gotten there ahead of us to whatever that glory can be. But it's actually more practical than that. Turn the page. I'm turning the page. Chapter 5, beginning in chapter 5, verse 1. Well, when's that going to happen? When's the Lord coming back? When should I get really, really ready? He said, now as to the times and such, brethren, you have no need of anyone to write to you, for you yourselves know well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. They're going to be saying peace and safety, and then destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with child, and they will not escape. But you, brethren, you're not in the darkness that the day would overtake you like a thief, for you're all sons of light and sons of day. We're not of night or darkness. So let us not sleep as others. That's just laziness, idolatry, self. It's just world. Let us be alert and sober. For those who sleep, they're sleeping at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on, and here's your three, the breastplate of faith, and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation. That's the destiny, to be saved through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether awake or asleep, when he comes back, we will live together with him. Encourage one another with these words. We just have to think about it more. The decisions you make, the way you're living your life, what you do for a living, how you spend your time and money, what you do tonight at 5 o'clock, it doesn't matter. I could use all kinds of things. Is this servicing where I'm going? Is this about what is eternal and what is real? You have a measure of that. I have a measure of that. We need to grow in it. We got to grow in it. So those are the practical things. You go, okay, well, that, those, are, those are tough. Again, sometimes the toughness is just identifying what they are, but growing in them is very tough. So I'm going to get back to where we started. Go to Titus 2, just three final passages. You cannot increase your work unless you deepen your faith. Your connection to God is going to have to, listen carefully and don't get offended, change. Your connection to God is going to have to change. I don't mean become different, I mean become deeper. I mean become more all-encompassing. Your love for God and God's love for you and the way you feel about God and the way you know He feels about you and the way that touches your heart is going to have to grow or the labor will not grow. And so if you're looking for motivation to do this, we're really back to embracing things about God. And I'll finish with these. But I really wish I could turn from my, oh, these idols. I just keep getting drawn into them. Some of them are just objectively just sinful, and some of them are just the world. It's work and money and sports and stuff, and I just can't get straight. How do we do it? Try harder. No, that's not the answer. The answer is you need more understanding, wisdom about the great grace of God. You need to know him more. He is better. Trading in worldly things for him is the best trade you can ever make. I'm reading a book right now, a Bob Goff book, Love Does. Anybody read that? And he talks about his teenage son going out with a dime to trade it up around the neighborhood. And he would go to somebody, he'd go, I'm just playing a little game. Can you, can you, Give me something bigger than this dime. And like the first guy gave him a mattress or something. I don't know what neighborhood he lived in. That's weird. So then he goes and he trades in the, the mattress for a ping pong table. And then the ping pong table for a moose head. And then two more things. Eventually someone gives him a Dodge pickup truck. And one day he traded in a dime like seven times. He ends up with a truck. And what does he do with it? He takes it down to a church and just hands them the keys. And he just goes, here, you guys help somebody with this. And the point that was being made in, in, that, in that story is like... 
God wants to trade with you, but the trade will be up. If you give up idolatry because you want more of his grace, his grace will blow away whatever that idol was. The trades with the Lord are always up to things that are better. We just get blinded and the idols look better. And they never are. Titus 2 stands out to me in verse 11. The grace of God has appeared. Titus 2, 11, the doctrine of God. That is what has happened in Christ, verse 10. The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. Yes, it's instructing us, no doubt. It's instructing us to deny ungodliness, to deny worldly desires, to live sensibly righteous and godly in the present age. But it's because we're looking for the blessed hope. And the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Christ Jesus. He gave himself for us. He redeemed us from all of our lawless deeds. He purified for himself a people who belong to him, zealous for good deeds. You can't get to the zealous for good deeds unless you are fully under, at least embracing the fact that he has cleansed you to become his. Grow in the grace of the Lord. Deepen your faith in him. I'll tell you this, every time I choose an idol over God, it's because I just don't trust God like I should. So that's what I'm working on this year. Left to right. Number two, his love. Go with me to 1 John chapter 4. It's probably the greatest example of this because it starts with talking about God's love for you. But the real text is about our point over here, which is loving one another better. Sacrificing for your brethren, servicing the needs of God's people, being all in. Like, that's the point. But the way you get to the point is from left to right. First John chapter 4, beginning in verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another. First John 4, 7. For love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love, you know why you don't love? Because you don't know God. You don't know, you see that? Man, why am I having so much trouble loving, forgiving? Showing compassion. Why do I keep putting my own desires ahead of God's people? It's because you don't know God. God's love will change you. He goes on to say, God is love. By this, the love of God was manifested in us that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. And this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, listen, this is it, the whole thing. If God so loved you, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us. Verse 11 is the key. If God so loved us, I just don't know that everybody in the room's got that so down just yet. I don't think I do fully. He so loved us, so loves you, continues to so love you. That the response will be, how do I love his people? How do I serve his people? How do I do what I should? Number three is hope. Oh. First Peter chapter one. All these different letters keep servicing these ideas over and over again. First Peter chapter one. Love first Peter one. Just want to begin in verse three. And I want you to notice that it's going to tell you to go out there and, and live for heaven and make the cuts and, and face the problems and do what's right. But the motivation isn't from God rewarding you after you prove yourself. The motivation is you believe in what he has promised you more than anything else in the world. Verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled, will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this, these hopes, these promises, these realities, you greatly rejoice, greatly. Even though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been distressed by various trials. So that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, you believe in him. You greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Verse 9, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your soul. Can you, can you see it? Can you see your soul being saved? Can you hear it? The reality of living for heaven and 
being sustained by the promises that God has kept me and will save me is what is going to keep me rejoicing even in trials. And let's just be honest. Let's just be real and raw. There are Christians in this room who in months past have let their trials sink their ships, take over their lives, change their attitudes, and pull them away from God. This text says, when you understand who you are in him and the fact that you are now adopted into an inheritance that cannot be touched or damaged or taken away by this world, that is going to cause you to face your trials very differently than the world does. Remember what I told you earlier? I don't think the, the devil's trying to stop this now by attacking us. He's just trying to assimilate us. I just want you to be like your neighbor who is happy when things are going well and completely falls apart when things aren't going well. I just want you to be like them. I can stop all of this by having you behave like everybody else. We cannot be that person. We live by God's promises and living hope. Well, let me finish with this. Thank you guys for your attention. Here's what we're going to do tonight. It, while you're there in the text, let me get back to it. Look in um, chapter 5. You're already there. I'll find it in a minute. If it's okay with you tonight, I want to come back when I get there. Chapter 5. And I want to look at verses 12 through 24. In verses 12 through 24, we're going to get a lot more practical stuff. And we're going to talk about how God gets behind that stuff. And how what you believe about what God is doing is going to change your capacity to do it. Things like appreciating your eldership. And so we'll get into that tonight. I know we don't have time today. But here's what I want to finish with. Turn to the right till you get to 2 Thessalonians 1. Paul wrote them two letters. We've taken a good look at the first letter. And I hope we've derived some things that we can use. Things that, uh, I, I had to do this, I'm sorry. Grace to faith to life things. I mean, that's, it's, all, it's there. It's everywhere. Grace, to, like it all starts with God's awesomeness, changes how you think and feel, and then your life changes. Like, that's what it is. It's everywhere. He wrote him a second letter. It has only been, listen carefully as we close, four to six months. It's not very long. What are we, in January now? That's, you know, end of the, starting into the spring. Not very long. Four to six months later. And listen to the first few verses. Paul and Silvanus and Timothy again. This is 2 Thessalonians 1.1. 1, 1, to the church of the Thessalonians and God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you. Peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brethren, as is only fitting. Watch this. Because your faith is greatly enlarged. And the love of each one of you towards one another grows ever greater. Therefore, we ourselves speak proudly of you among the churches of God for your perseverance and faith in the midst of all of your persecutions and afflictions which you endure. And then he goes on to say, you know, you guys already know this because you trust God, but God's going to take care of those people. God's going to take care of the opposition. You just trust in him. Here's my thought. Four to six months later, he says, you guys have greatly increased in all of these things. But here's the thing. First of all, you got to decide if you're in. Are you in? You in with God's people? You in for this? Then we got to decide, what is this stuff? What, what practically does it mean? It's these three things on the right and all the subcategories. But mainly, I have to ask you, are you willing to go on a journey with us this year? Our Bible classes? Our daily Bible reading programs? Emails we send out? Like, are you ready to go on a journey of discovering a deeper relationship with the Lord? Because on the inside, you grow your faith, and He motivates it, and your love and your hope, and then things change. This is what we want to do. And within just a few months, you can see changes that maybe you hadn't seen in years. I'm excited about that. As an individual, as a family, and as a church. You need help? You need encourage you're, you're in the right place. This is where God's people are all walking in the same direction. We want to encourage you. If you're not a child of God, this is the most beautiful journey because it stands on the promises of God, not your own accomplishments. Your accomplishments are built upon the promises of God. You want a life like that? That kind of firm footing, you can have it in Jesus. Come and respond to the gospel now.